because I believe science might offer an answer to the curse of the Bambino. Why someone took so long to hire that guy is beyond me. Anybody who's not tearing their team down right now and rebuilding it using your model, they're dinosaurs. One of the great things about money is it, it buys a lot of things. One of which is the luxury to disregard what baseball likes, doesn't like, what baseball thinks, doesn't think. <laughs> This is threatening, not just a way of doing business, but, it's, but in their minds, it's threatening the game. How can you not be romantic about baseball? All right, Brent Porcio here at another Baseball Ops podcast. Uh, happy to say we've got special guest, better known as Spike Richards, but uh, Derek, do Derek, you go as, by Spike or Derek more commonly? I do. Now, I've had Spike since I was a year old. I mean, it's on my diploma and everything. So I, I didn't hear that. You said you don't you you don't go by Spike or you do? Yeah, no, I do. I go by Spike. I've had that since I was a year old. Okay, so that's kind of that's your nickname, basically. Is that what it is? Oh yeah, yeah. What is what does it mean? Is it is it something you want to tell the story about? <laughs> yeah, no, I just had it. You know, since I was a little kid, and it just stuck. And everybody at home has, uh, you know, growing up about an hour and a half south of Chicago around the Champaign Danville area. Everybody has a nickname. Nobody goes by their real name for some reason. <laughs> I'm sure it must mean something like you were a real baller when you're a kid or something. You must have been pretty <laughs> yeah, tough. <laughs> I wish that's what it was. <laughs> well, uh, t- well, good. Well, tell everybody what you do, and, and then we're going to dive into it. Uh, yeah, I do all the uh, sports performance um, programming, training, coaching at uh, South Central Regional uh, Medical Center. I owned my own gym for nine, ten years and uh, started out as CrossFit and just knew I wanted to deal with athletes and that CrossFit was a very bad mix. Uh, It was better than nothing than a kid sitting on the couch, but it's definitely not sport training. And I wanted to work with athletes. So went away from CrossFit and had, uh, you know, won a uh, silver medal in uh, weightlifting in 2015. Nice. And uh, as a master's and then qualifying for the world finals in 16 i broke a tibia on the last lift before we left oh and uh, went to hit a clean and jerk and just snapped it wow and uh, so rehab got that done came back at 2017 went up another weight class to the 94s and took a bronze there and um you know qualified for the world finals four times and then now just so busy with athletes that i just don't have time to train that competitive so Hopefully we can put more athletes in the streets than uh, than myself, and that that'll be enough for me. So you're you're an Olympic guy, I guess. Do you still yes. use that in, in your training? Lifts. I'm sorry. Do you do you program that into your training a lot? You know, we do use some Olympic lifts. Um, yeah, uh, I think there's a good correlation to it. it teaches speed, power. Um, it makes the whole body work well. Coordination. Um, I do program those, uh, and even to everybody. Even my soccer players, they can all clean. I personally stay away from snatching. I know people that like snatching in their programs. Um, I kind of look at things at risk and reward. Um, So if somebody wants to put them in there and they're comfortable with their guys, that's great. Me personally, um, we also are connected with the physical therapy department here at the hospital. So I see a lot of shoulder injuries coming through. Just for me and my personal programming, I stay away from the snatch unless I have an Olympic lifter. Uh, but I have one world qualified lifter with me now, and then I have four females that are all national lifters. So, you know, male or female, I'm not afraid of it. I just don't use the snatch in my programming. Yeah, I neither do I, man. In there for sure. I haven't put them in, in too, specifically because I'm mostly with baseball players. And, you know, baseball players, you know, studies show they have weaker shoulders than the average pub- public, basically uh, throwing shoulders. So Yeah, there's so much slack in them. Yeah, and so it's something that I do to get uncomfortable with. I, I bring it in, like, way – like, if I've been with an athlete for three years in my programming and we've gotten – because we start doing a lot of shoulder work uh, pretty heavy into it once their shoulders get – decent amount of strength and and so like way later in if they want to bring it in i'll entertain it but i do i I do stay away from the snatches too yeah and i mean because it takes so much effort to learn a snatch i just think that you can get a lot more programming with a young athlete that will benefit them quicker than taking the time to teach the snatch yeah and i think the the variations we can get from the clean and the jerk are a lot i mean we can 
We can Tons. do, you know, clean pulls, hang cleans, different variations of hang cleans, you know, like blow the knee cleans. We can get into power cleans. You could do full cleans. You could do then your power jerks, your split jerks. You do three position cleans or top to bottoms, whatever you want to call them. I think there's just so much you can do just with clean and jerks. Yeah, you can even do uh, triphasic stuff from the eccentrics and the isometrics right. with them too. Exactly. We use a lot of isometric stuff. Um, say if I have a kid that's going out to – Saturday, he's gonna go and um, he's gonna go to a big showcase, and he wants to train. I'll do isometrics with him just to prime the system. You know, a lot of Russians have talked about different things like that, um, priming the system. But since there's no tissue being moved, there's no there's no inflammation, and they're not sore. Right. And so isometrics work really well a couple of days before a big a big uh, competition. Well, go into that. Go into like your style of programming. Like, I mean, if obviously my audience is more baseball players, can we gear it towards more baseball? Like, what do you think yeah. is is a good approach to as far as programming a strength and development pr- approach for? Let's start with a young baseball player. Like, what what's a good kind of format for that? So for us, you know, depending on now, you you've got you know your your kid that's already big, and he doesn't need to put body weight on. Or you got the kid that, look, he's just undersized. He's got to put body weight on. Either way, we still go with a hypertrophy phase. And I like, you know, three to four weeks of, of a hypertrophy phase, um, three by tens. And then the next week I'll go three by ten again. But then their challenge is to add five pounds to, to whatever lift that was. And then the next week we go three by twelves for two weeks. So again, the 12, you're now trying to use the prior weight and get 12 with. The second 12, week of 12, you're trying to add five pounds. So there's four weeks. I usually then do maybe a slight deload on that next week. Then I come back with a four by 10 for two under the same kind of parameters, trying to increase weight, uh, the second one. And then four by 12, then we back them out. Uh, And then we'll come back and do another hypertrophy phase if maybe that kid needs to put on size. Cause now you're about nine weeks, 10 weeks into a cycle. Um, you know, and then sometimes some of these kids, they're playing so much ball, you, you don't get to do full cycles with them. So I like a hypertrophy phase plus it's endurance, um, muscular endurance. You can't get enough of that. So you're not doing any technical stuff then like with the Olympic lifts at that point? Uh, we do, we introduce them. Um, we will do those at the very beginning. Everybody here, first, they'll learn how to move around the bar. And then once they're comfortable with the bar, then I'll introduce the uh, clean. I mean, once they can deadlift, then we clean. So we start with deadlifts. You start with your basics, your squats, your hex bars, um, all of that stuff. And then it's such an easy transfer into, um, into cleans. That's cool. So you, 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 find, that you find that's a good base. That they come in and start cleaning. Yeah, I was just saying you find that's a good base doing all the deadlifting work before you get into all the cleaning. Oh, absolutely, because I want the hamstrings and the posterior strong. So, and I really like the sumo. I do a lot of sumo stuff. You know, we may pull one week from the ground, and then the next week, you know, once we get the base, and then the next week we may do a deficit. Then the next week we'll go from a three-inch box, and next week we go from a six-inch box. We do a lot of um, hyperextensions. A lot of posterior work because that's where all your power and your speed is going to be coming from. Right. Plus, most of these kids are sitting so much. Yeah. Their posteriors are weak. Uh, yeah. You know, and nobody, nobody says they pull a quad. They're always pulling hamstrings and backs. Yeah, and then you know, and then your your fast athletic kids are typically so quad dominant very young. Exactly. So you know, and the quad actually slows them down. The hamstring will speed you up. Right. I mean, look at the sprinters. They're just massive. Right. So how do you advance? So once they get that good base through the hypertrophy phase, where do you go from there? Then I like to go through um, a four by eight, which is still slightly um, hypertrophy. We'll kind of see how the kid reacts. Then we like to go into a five by five and we just watch the volume from there. That's when we really start tracking volume um, to make sure that they're not too much. Then um, about four to six weeks of that, we slide into usually a two week triphasic phase so you'll have your eccentrics for two weeks your isometrics for two weeks your contractions for two weeks so that gives you another six weeks then we deload them at 80 percent now that's when we start developing the power and the speed we drop it all the way down to 30s and 40 percent for two weeks 
and we will either peak them at that point in time and hand them off to their coach or we start the cycle again just depending on where they are you know like some of my ball players i've had i've got one girl that came in she committed to southern miss and she was a slap hitting second baseman but we knew we had a full 12 months because she wasn't playing her senior year at high school it's low level high school and so um when we got her back to southern miss she uh, was planning on leading off. They took batting practice. She hit 15 home runs for her first batting practice round. Wow. And they just said, so what happened? So, well, we just got her faster and more powerful. Right. And now she's actually leading off, and she leads Southern Miss in home runs. That's awesome. Well, what, So what do you recommend when you do hand them off to their coaches? Do, what do you recommend? Do you, uh, do you give them any type of programming for maintaining through the year? We try to. You know, I think at least two, weeks, two days a week. Um, and then we'll – I personally like taking the volume down, but the weight up, you know, because you build all this base of strength, but you just got to take the volume way down because they're throwing so much, they're running so much, their bodies can't recover. So if we were doing a normal four or five sets, I want to back it down to two, two good sets at 85 to 95% for two reps. That's it. Just maintain. Yeah, I think that's key. Um, you're right. I mean, especially in, in there. I mean, I drop my – I mean, I only really have them even lifting two times a week. But trying to bring some power in, you know, period-wise, like I'll give them like an unloading week and then maybe some couple of power weeks in there, even in season, but not with a lot of volume, just to try to maintain that power, keep that central nervous system sensitive. Uh, do you? How much are they lifting a week in season or would you recommend – I want two days, you know, and it's, it's really hard for the high school coach to understand that they need to continue to do some type of lifting. The problem is you get this, this athlete that comes in and he's, he, he leaves his strength coach if they've done it right. And he's, and he's one athlete, his hands are a certain speed. Everything's there. His coordination is there, but then you're eight weeks into a season and they've lost 15 pounds. They've lost sometimes, you know, 20 pounds cause they're not eating. They're not doing what they need to. They're not training. You don't have that same ball player that you did eight weeks, nine weeks, ten weeks before, and now you're going into a state playoff, and you're wondering why, uh uh-oh, what's going on? Well, even their coordination is different. They're not hitting the ball like what they were. They're not throwing it like they were. And and they ask why. Well, I'm 15 pounds lighter. Right. I mean, there's and there's a strong correlation to that drop in, in weight to performance. Oh, there's no doubt. It's like you have two different athletes. You're playing a season – with one athlete, and then when you finish the season, you have a different one. Well, I mean, I've had it happen so many times. Injury rate, too. Yeah. I mean, the injury rate. I mean, look, you, you get these kids that are – I mean, we, we maintenance high-performance cars when we race them. Right. But we, we want a kid to go out and throw – you know, at a high school level, if you've got a good, solid pitcher anywhere between upper 80s and low 90s, and you're not going to maintenance him that got him there. Right. No, I think it doesn't make a lot of just common sense to me. It doesn't, and it's critical. Like I had a big leaguer came in, and he had been injured his whole career, and he said, "Brent, I had done a lot of this lifting that we were doing one season." He says, and then I went to spring training; it was the best I'd ever felt. And he goes, "And I'm dominating," and I'm like, "Man, this is going to be a great year for me." And then two months into the season, I'm hurt again, and I said, "Well, did you stop the lifting?" He goes, "Yeah, I stopped everything," and I'm like, "Why? (laughs) Like what?" But it doesn't even seem logical to me. Like, if you feel so great and you know what you've been doing, why would you stop? You know, and a lot of the, a lot of the baseball is that old school stuff. They don't uh, – it's not really a, a culture that likes to, likes change. But the fact is these bodies are changing. They're, they're heavier. They're bigger. They're faster. You've got to maintenance them. But they're used to workouts now. Right, and, and so what happens is is they go into what they feel is this, the baseball strength training, which is long toss, weighted balls. Like this is this is considered their strength training. I mean, I mean, you hear them right. say that they say things all the time, like, "Well, you got to get you know, it's arm strength. It's all about arm strength." To me, I I started realizing that over time because when I would talk to coaches about in season lifting, they would almost come back to me with you know their protocols for throwing like that was their lifting approach because i didn't understand it i was like why are they coming back with an argument of how their weight their weighted ball uh, approach or their long toss approach is is adequate to a strength and conditioning approach then i started realizing i think they think it's the same thing (laughs) 
I mean, do, do you get that impression? Yeah, we really do. And we've got a couple, um, you know, we're in a small town, Mississippi, but we've got a couple major league guys here in town. And it, it's it's funny to listen to them talk. So, And I had one, I won't mention his name because I told him I was going to be on. He's like, man, I'm not playing well. You know, don't mention this. And, <laughs> You know, and I said, no problem. I don't want to jinx it. But I said, you know, what program did you have before we start working? Because if you're going to come down here all summer from, you know, northern states or all winter, I don't want you coming down here if you're going to do what you already have. Let me see what the program is. Not any power at all. None. And this guy was a form, you know, all through high school. His brother played pro football. Um, He was used to big, hard pounding weights. Now, would I take a normal Anybody that does that? No. I mean, this guy throws plus 100. He's used to being pushed, and everybody kept wanting to back him out, back him out. His body needed it. I mean, he didn't feel right if he wasn't under loads. And the guy trained hard. He wanted, I would have to back him out. He wanted to train six days a week and then felt great doing it, but we backed him out. And, you know, things went well, but you're right. Um, it, it's not the same. It's not, the connective tissue is not the same. The tendons aren't the same. Uh, when you're throwing a weighted ball, the tendon's taking so much stress, but are you doing any work to heal the tendon? Tendons and muscles are different. Muscles grow, you know, what, double the rate of a tendon, and we're putting all this stress on them, but yet we're not using any type of band work specifically for the tendons. You know, the maintenance, it's almost backwards sometimes once they get into the big. Yeah, I think with the weighted balls, they they feel like, you know, it, it, it is. It, they say it's like working out. It's like baseball's weight room is, is throwing away the ball. And then I try to make the contrast of that would be – then it would be like me taking a dumbbell. And, you know, studies show up to 60 pounds of force can go into external rotation when you're throwing at a high speed. That would be like me taking a 60-pound dumbbell and slamming it back into external rotation in a weight room. If, if we're going to call throwing a, weight ball, a weighted ball – uh, you know, like being in the weight room and strengthening our arms. I mean, and, and once again, it's not it really. It's not even addressing the lower half here. Um, but but don't you? Don't, how could you even say it's healthy when you're slamming into a valgus position all this weight? How how would you even? What coach would even consider that to be healthy? Well, and then you know, saying that, and you're looking at research. The research shows injury rates. It, it's not something that you can really argue. You can say, oh, it's this and that. They, they're they looking at six-week studies. Let's say just the six-week studies are showing. I've seen anywhere between, you know, I went to um, the the Andrews. Uh, ASMI, Baseball week, and the, Injuries in Course. In January. What's that? Yeah, it was the Baseball and Injuries Course, right? Yeah, yeah, it was in. Um, Birmingham. It was in January in Birmingham. Yeah. And, I mean, it was top guys in there. It was even major league doctors are going, look. The weighted balls, do they work? You can't argue that, yes, 4%. They had six different studies. I've got them on file. If people want to see the research, you know. And it says 4%. Well, it also showed for um, four or five other research. It says one was just band work for the core. One was just medicine ball work for the core. One was weights and one was a combination. They all had 4% velocity increases with no injury. The only injury rate was with weighted balls. I don't sell weighted balls. I don't not sell weighted balls. But the fact is, my kid is not going to touch something that has an injury rate when there's four programs right next to it that he's going to get the exact same benefit from. You know, we're talking from a kid level here. We're not talking top level guys. We're talking about kids that aren't truly developed. But yet we're going to take a 14, 15, 16 year old young man whose bones aren't developed, who his frame's going to hold another 30 pounds by the time he's 21. And we're going to put, we're going to shortcut it with a weighted ball that again, more research is showing that it's up to 10% more external rotation. Your body at that age is not supposed to find 10 more. Yeah. When you, and specifically if you already have a lot of joint rotation. laxity in your shoulder. Yeah. You know, and they don't even know. And, it, it, you know, I've, there's a lot of other things talking about different lat tears and this and that. Well, I mean, the lat really generates a lot of power. So if I'm putting an extra weight on it and it's storing energy in there, I mean, I'm not a doctor. All I can do is say 
there's something going on. And if the injury rates continue to be this high, now they have no way to even understand after the six-week program, where are the injury rates there? Because there's nobody studying it. Nobody's tracking these kids after six weeks, but yet they're still getting injured. Was it after effects? You know, they, they have proof that after a, at a, after a uh, weight program, a hypertrophy phase, things like that, that the delayed effect can be three and four months later right. on, say, legs, power of legs, because the body has to now learn how to its motor skills with this new power. Right. So you're going to tell me that a weighted ball doesn't do the same thing on an elbow, a lap, a shoulder? No, I mean, scab. actually, it, it absolutely does. And I interviewed Reinhold after the six week study and he went into, they actually did follow them. They followed him for the next year or two. And more of the injuries from the study actually came in that follow up up to the point where they had that kid who even cracked a rib. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is, you're exactly right. Like, like he was actually even saying after the study that most of the damages from a weighted ball approach come after the training. So a lot of people, they're like, oh, I didn't get hurt in the training. You're still not, the coast isn't clear. You still, <laughs> you still are more susceptible to injury as you go into the season. Well, and then my other thing is too, and, it, and this is only from the handful of people that I know, um, and I've seen them on weighted balls. Um, a buddy of mine was my pitching instructor when I owned a baseball facility, came out of Ole Miss, Tommy John. He had it from the weighted ball. He says, I know it came from the weighted ball. There's no doubt. Um, he's actually down there in uh, Baton Rouge now. And, um, you know, what weight program were these kids on to maintenance their body afterwards? Or do we just go to a six-week program and then forget everything else? But yeah, it's like you said, risk. Did squat? Did we deadlift? Did we press? Doubtful. Because right. they would rather do a six week program that guarantees a result instead of train with a process. I just don't think that you can, in a non developed athlete, throw a weighted ball in their hand and say that you're following a process. Nobody will argue me that and, and convince me of it. The process is the process from the very beginning to the very end. Look, you know what? If you're if you're a senior in college, you're now 22, 23, you know, full facial hair. I mean, you're you're a man now. And it's between getting drafted and getting a normal job and you need a couple miles an hour and you're willing to risk it all, maybe. But 14, 15, 16-year-old kids, they're not developed yet. Right. And, and like I said, the joint laxity is already probably um, pretty extreme in the in those young kids, and then you're in an approach that is proven to increase and enhance that laxity, and and specifically in your shoulder. So, it's it, you're right. It young kids, like you said, need to come in with a good general foundation of strength and power development, and then you know if. Maybe they always say later on in your career if you want to do a weighted ball program, but I don't even know if it ever even goes to should you do a weighted ball program because, like you were saying, risk versus reward. We don't put snatches in our approach because we know the gains that we can make there might not be worth it if we seriously injure ourselves because we are taking a risk. Now, yeah, and the only reason why I even said you know an older individual like that now is because you're looking at an age where you know he's basically basically a man and he's going to be making his own risk versus rewards so if you're going to let that athlete understand what he's getting into a 15 year old kid only knows that he wants to make mom dad happy or show off for the local show class you know showcase team so he's going to do whatever he has to he doesn't understand down the road and that's where you know parents have to come in with a better understanding that look our job is still to protect these kids. I mean, look at if you went into a local uh, PT office and a kid was in there three or four times in the last year and a half for elbow problems, right? And it was and he was bruised. They would call the local authorities because it's child abuse. But yet we can do it in baseball and it's called athletics. Just have a hard time with it. Exactly, and and you know, I don't know if. Uh... You've heard? Have you ever heard of Kurt Hester? I'm not familiar with Kurt, him off, Kurt, offhand. Kurt was my strength coach. He's the head strength coach at Louisiana Tech, and he was saying it's very similar in like sprinting sports where they want to they want to over sprint and then they wind up having you know they wind up 
pulling and injuring hamstrings from the overuse of the, mm-hmm. of the skill. And he said the same thing you see with baseball is they want to overthrow and then they wind up having shoulder arm related injuries due to that wear and tear. So it's 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 that mentality of sports specificity is 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 ideal. It is ideal to be able to train within the skill, but the problem is if the volume, like you even said earlier, if the volume grows too high, then the training starts becoming uh, the source of the injury, and that's that's the last thing you want to do when you're taking all this extra time to try to improve your skill is to make it even worse because you're injuring yourself. Yeah, I tell every single kid in here. I said, look. The weight room is to allow you to be better in sport. Don't get hurt in here, but don't go playing eight to nine months. You never get a chance to get bigger. And and I've been doing this long enough now that you can see the kids that are playing eight months, nine months. Because, I mean, it's warm down here where we are. You know, up north, they don't really have the choice. But down here, we can play a lot more. And you can see the kids that at 11 were just studs. 12, they were just studs. Now, all of a sudden... You move that uh, that mound back, and those bases open up, and the kid that was hitting bombs but couldn't make it to first base now cannot make it to first base, and he never took any time to get better. He never got any time to get faster, stronger. Um, they just kind of stagnant, and you almost feel bad for that kid because it wasn't his choice. Mom, dad, coach, you know. At 11-year-old, 12-year-old didn't understand or care to say, hey, wait, I've got to develop this kid. The biggest thing is we, we the kids aren't being developed. Allow a kid to develop and then see what happens. And, and then they're waiting to the last minute. You know, I had a kid on the show who he's like, he was he's 17, and he's already having his second Tommy John surgery. And, oh. you know, and I asked him, when was the first time you, you started training and trying to develop your body? And he said, right after his first surgery, that was the first time he actually took an off season. So that's the problem is these kids are playing all year round. And the only time they actually sit down and consider some type of development is after they've had a serious injury, you know, you know, you saying that is absolutely uh, reminds me, Dr. Andrews himself on in January. And if, Anybody doesn't know who I am or who you are. They know who Dr. Andrews is. He is, he's the authority. And he said, the reason why these guys are coming out better, it's not the surgery. It's because they're learning rehab and actually training for the first time in their life. Exactly. He said, the misconception is that the surgery makes them better. He said, that's not it. It's that you got everything else healthy. If you would go through all the rehab of a Tommy John without doing the surgery and work your body, he said you would have been just as good without the surgery or better. No, I think that's exactly it. And, you know, ASMI, and Andrew. That, the whole place lit up, was like, oh, wow. Right. And, and, and ASMI, you know, their studies have shown that if you pitch more than eight months out of the year, you're five times more likely to have injury. If you pitch, you know, oh, yeah. if you pitch fatigued, you're Absolutely. 36 times more likely to have injury. If you play on a, you know, if you play showcase baseball, you're like seven times more likely. If you play two uh, leagues at one time, you're like, you know, five times more likely. Like the point is, is, you can see it. There's just there's too much volume in the game of baseball, and you need to pull it back. Like period. Like you need to start learning. If you're a player or a coach, you need to start learning seasons. You need to start promoting seasons, meaning off season, preseason, in season. Not spring. My spring baseball season. My summer baseball season. My fall baseball season. No, like off season. I'm not playing. I'm just training. And that doesn't mean throwing, throwing, throwing. That means lift and and get be- become a better mover with drills and exercises and then learn how to peak into your seasons. I mean, is don't you think we need to be pushing and teaching these kids about the off-season, preseason, in-season approach? Oh, absolutely. And you know, we've got we've got both um, spectrums here in this area, you know. My luckily my son's high school coach, you know, come uh, August or September if he finds out you touch a ball, you're off the team. He shuts it down four to six weeks. You are not allowed to touch. You're in the weight room. Now, on the other side, we've got another one of my guys. He, you know, he's a great kid. I mean, just an amazing kid. Kept going to showcases. And I said, man, what would your showcase come out? Well, I'm not quite fast enough here. I said, okay. What would your last one go? It was the same thing three in a row. I said, buddy, why are you still showcasing? All you're doing is proving them that you're not fast enough in this area. Why don't we spend the time to get faster? Well, my travel league ball coach 
oh, really? So you probably don't think he's getting some of the kickback of the money that you're paying him to go to the showcase? This guy don't care about you. Yeah. I mean, it's a proven. Right. And you're, what you're doing is proving that you're slow in this area. Yeah, I always say like you wouldn't go to a trade show with a, with a bad product or a product that's halfway done. I mean, no. you're not going to show off your product if it's not ready. So don't be going to showcases if you know you don't have anything to show them. Like I I don't know why it's a new mentality, man. When we went to tryouts when we were young, we were we would we made sure that we were going to produce what they were looking for. I knew it. I knew they wanted 90 when I was a kid. And I and you know there I did go to some tryouts before I was there just to kind of get the experience. But I knew once I was ready, I had to achieve that number. And 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 once I did, I got more attention. Doesn't mean I got what I wanted, but I did get more attention. So we need to be going to these showcases after we've developed what we know they are looking for. Right. We had a kid, another kid, come in, and uh, I said, uh, he said, man, I went to a showcase this weekend. He was all pumped about it. And I said, really? I said, well, that's not where we're at in training right now. How'd you do? I'm not lying to you. Through mid-70s. This is high school. I said, well, why did you go? He said, Spike, how can you even say that to me? I said, I'm not being rude. Why would you go show a college coach you throw 75? Yeah, right. Hide. Your best bet's to hide. Hope he never sees 75, that it was, you know what I mean? Right. You would rather them go, where have you been? I'm, who are you? We never knew there was a guy throwing this hard, as opposed to, yeah, we've watched you for 10 years, and, you know, you've gained a mile an hour a year, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and the numbers aren't hard to find. All you have to do is go online, Google um, specs. I tell all my kids, look, de- decide what level ball you want to play. You know, if it's Division One and you're an outfielder, you're going to need to throw 93 plus from the outfield, most likely. You're going to have to run about a four, what a 4.0 from the right side. You have to be able to play some defense and hit the ball in the gap. If you can't do that, stay home until you can. Right. Right. Because all you are is a number to these showcase guys. They got a stopwatch. You have a number. When you throw 96, now all of a sudden you become a name. It's because I think a lot of those kids got corrupted when they were young. You know, their their parents might have gotten in the way and politically got, may have pulled some moves to get them on teams. Uh, they might have, like, befriended the right coaches and, and, you know, were kind of like, oh, made the team because the coach liked them. They might have, like, slipped mm-hmm. through some levels just politically, and then that gave them the impression that I can go to a, a you know, a college tryout or a professional tryout and the same thing's going to happen, which is doesn't happen. I mean, just get over it, right? So, I, I mean, I just well, think they're corrupt. You know, I tell my son the hard – People will tell me, you know, you, you're so blunt with your kid. And I said, well, life is blunt, okay? It just is. And I'm, I tell him the same thing. Look, I, I don't care if your high school coach likes or dislikes you. I really don't. You're, you need to be a good kid. But I love you as my son. And if you can't throw 90-plus from the outfield, you're not playing at another level. That doesn't mean you're not going to be successful in life. It just means that Division One baseball is not for you. Yeah, you know, baseball and baseball is getting frustrated with that. Like it's it's so velocity focused, and I'm like, well, you're well, you know what? I mean, you should be happy. There's more metrics coming out now that they're paying attention to, but still, right. it's, it's hard to say velocity is never going to be a factor. That'd be like telling a wide receiver in football that how fast he runs is not is one day not going to be a factor. When's that ever not going to be a factor? It, it's not. Speed absolutely kills. Right. You don't see any. Highlight videos of ESPN of kids running an 8 right? Right. I mean, it just – it doesn't happen. Right. I mean, but, and, but you can be affected. If you can't do it, don't be upset with the system. That's just – speed is the game. Yeah, I mean – Speed kills. And, and as far as a pitcher, there's way more ways to deceive because speed and velocity in pitching is a deception factor. You're giving the hitter less time to react. So we can do that mm-hmm. in other ways, too. We can do that in extension from release point from the rubber. We can do that in spin rates. We can do that in, you know, movements, uh, if, if spin efficiencies. Like, there's other ways to determine deception. But you- Well, that's where you have to get with a good co- – like, you know, me and you have talked off of this, is I've got guys that I want down there with you because, look, that's not – they don't have that level of coach – that are getting my guys where I think they can be. You know, when you're looking at a guy that's got a six foot five frame, I know that I can put 20 pounds on him. I also know that I can't teach him how to pitch. 
you know, right. I'll say, all right, Brent, I'll put the body on him. I need you to put the rest of it together. Right. I'm not trying to do your job, you know. Right. No, I no. And high school coach is in a really hard, hard position because, you know, maybe they're supposed to know. Well, the fact is they can't know it all. You can't know the mechanics of every pitcher and then also be a great infield coach. Right. No, I mean, I, I can work well with strength coaches. I, I mean, I, in a way, I'm, I look at myself as one, but I'm more of, I'd say, a movement specialist. I don't even like being considered a, a pitching coach because all I look at is the kinetic chain. How well are you optimizing your kinetic chain? And, you know, I measure it, I evaluate it, and I try to understand why is it not optimal. And then I go in and I try to build it. And I build it in the, in, in the weight room. I build it in our drills. And, you know, I love working with other strength coaches because they help me better understand programming and, and peaking athletes. But it, my focus is, and, I, and I've kind of put myself in a unique niche, is I'm more just a movement specialist. I mean, I obviously have stuck to pitching. But don't you think that this is where it's all really going? The, the more better we become with measuring and understanding body movements, don't you think we're all going to eventually become movement specialists? That's really the ultimate goal is, is coaches, you know? I think if you're going to be uh, develop an athlete, again, I keep saying develop an athlete, you absolutely have to. One of my big guys right here, um, Byron, Byron Young, great guy. Yeah, really impressive, man. Player. Yeah, I mean, he's going to Alabama. He's a four-star defensive end. You know, the first day I saw him, ankle was stiff. So that's what's causing this. It's the same thing with baseball players, the thoracic movement and stuff that you're diagnosing, um, evaluating. Wait a minute. We can get more out of this because his body's not moving well here. If I get his body moving well here, I've got more separation, which is going to give him more core torque, which is more follow through. And absolutely, if you don't know how a body's supposed to move and then translate that, you truly can't be a good coach, in my opinion. I think, too. Don't you think that's You what, can't develop an athlete to its potential. That's a better way for me to say that. Yeah, don't you think strength coaches, they can get stuck there because if they don't truly understand the movement patterns that they're trying to help them improve, that a lot of times, if they don't understand that process, a lot of times they, they, they start like just always changing their methods because you know they're looking for the next best thing because they really aren't focused on a specific outcome. They're just focused on like a role, but not really getting a true result. Do you see that in with strength coaches? Oh yeah, and because they don't have a process, they're just shooting by the hip. Um, strength and things that to me is very scientific. It's if you can develop a, a program through science, you really can't argue science. It, you just can't argue it. That's why they use science with, you know, in doctors, because you, it's not an opinion. Oh, I think if I did this, well, then you can't take another athlete and um, duplicate it. But if you can duplicate it consistently, then what you do is now watch your athlete and say, all right, well, this one's a little bit different. we got to tweak it slightly off this. There's no template. But if you can't do it scientifically, I think, I think you're guessing. And I don't think over the long term you're going to continue to produce the, the results that you want. Or they don't know where the, what result they want. You know, um, matter of, like with uh, Madison Rayner, um, my hitter, at my softball girl there at Southern Miss, I just called the coach said, what do we need? What do, you, what do you want her to look like? And what do you need her to do? Because if I send her out there one way, but the coach is wanting her in another, well, then I fail. the coach says, I don't know what I'm doing. No, I made her what I thought you wanted. I need you to point blank tell me what do you want. Exactly. And, and that's why you become a really good strength coach. But if you're just sitting there just giving them some general protocol to get stronger and faster, that might not really produce what they want. Because if they have some, say, hip mobility issue or they got um, poor motor control and you know, they, they, they're strong but they can't use it complex and complex movements you i mean really what have you done for them you've might have actually made them worse getting them stronger like that oh yeah absolutely yeah so i mean and i can see it on the other end pitching coaches you know pitching coaches that don't want to understand uh exercise fitness or or you know kinesiology and and you know and, they, and then they want to because there's they're they're intimidated by it they want to scare the players away from even you know learning it you know, I think they need to also almost try to do the same thing, become more 
educated in kinesiology or, or in fitness and and understand how that applies and understand how that affects the uh, the skill that you're trying to help uh, improve. Like it's the, the point is, is at the end of the day, I think we're really all doing the same thing or we're we can be we can specialize. But at the end of the day, we're all just trying to do the same thing, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think, in the, you know, kind of like we've talked and there's been things that we've professionally somewhat disagreed on on this and that. But that doesn't mean that we didn't both get something out of it. And if you're working together for one goal, you're not trying to get the other person's job. And I think that's where, you know, some of the either a pitching coach or a, or a high school coach or a, a travel ball coach is afraid that, wait a minute, maybe this guy. No, I don't want my job. I want to hand you an athlete that you can go do your job better with. If I hand you an athlete that's bigger, faster, stronger, you're going to win and he's going to be healthy. All I need you to do is follow what I ask for, for you to do to keep him healthy. And then when you're done, give him back to me and I'll bring him back to you better. Yeah, I think I think that's it. And, and you know, I think it's too is, is I think if we were all all these coaches were understanding we're all trying to do the same thing, we can all kind of get on the same page and learn from each other. And that's that's another big challenge. The industry, everybody is like wants to be on their own little islands and and challenge people and not really try to help everybody come together and and, and do what the really the ultimate goal here is, is develop young athletes. I mean, don't you think there, there yeah. needs to be more collaboration in the industry? Yeah, because, uh, you know, like even with my, my athletes, I give them free reign, even the young ones. I say, look, if, if there's something on here that you don't see transfers into your sport, for whatever reason, I'm not on the soccer field. So if you don't feel that this is going to transfer, I need you to be respectful. Let's talk it through. And if it doesn't truly transfer, we take it out. We're not using it. There's no busy work here. You know, exactly. Um, that's that's if I've got a football guy that says, hey, I don't think, why are we doing this? Matter of, something you'd be so crazy as is uh, hip strength. So these guys, young kids, I put a bar with uh, double body weight or three quarters of their max on a safety squat bar. They have to sit there and march with it 100 steps where their knees are above their belt 100 steps at a time. You'd think, well, that's nothing they die why hips the most simplistic thing with walking isn't walking when you put massive loads on like that and then um you know it it, it makes them balanced because maybe you find out man one hip's more sore than the other what's going on well you're favoring one let's get it straight little things like that yeah, and I, and I even do simple things like these. You know, the kids come to my velocity camps and they want to throw ninety miles an hour, and I put a dowel over their head and I tell them to overhead squat, ass to grass, and most majority of them are just struggling with a stick in their hand. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so it, it's it's like they they want they see the elites, they want to be at the elite level, but they have no concept of the machine that they're going to have to become to actually do that. And they don't understand how they acquired it. They all think it was just gifted to them and some, some it was gifted, but there's those that actually went through the process of understanding and building. And, and unfortunately baseball doesn't educate them that. So they all come in completely ignorant of how it works. And then when you start telling them it's this long road, you got, you got to see the looks on their face. It's just like you, you know, you you just killed their dog or something. It's like you you ruin their life. You crush their dream because baseball kept them blind. And then, like I've always said, baseball desperately needs a combine, not just for what I believe it will help in the scouting departments, but it will help the young kids that are playing this game truly understand what it takes to be at the top level. I mean, do you would you see it the same way? Yeah, and what I, would you agree that that goes back to they're not process oriented? Well, I mean, what do you mean by process oriented? I mean, like you don't. Well, think, I mean, they, they, they understand have, a process they when they're trying to perfect a swing or they're trying to get better at ground balls, but I don't see them taking it anywhere else. Right. That's my. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm with you on that. It just. Yeah. You know, I just think, unfortunately. Just want the result. What's the fastest way to the result? Well, I understand the fastest way to the result, but if we drill that to where the result is every single time and there's a process to it, when maybe we're having a problem here, here, and here, we go back to the process and we can um, duplicate it. Does that make sense? 
No, no, I'm with you. It, it just, I just feel like the the challenge is them helping them understand that how, you know, like you said, putting a bar on your back and walking with your knees up, mm-hmm. that, how that actually General- can affect a, a skill that can, that will affect your pitching delivery. That will affect your swing. They don't understand that. Yeah. You know, the other thing that, you know, I, and I don't know how it is down there, but if you come into my hometown, which is here in Laurel, Mississippi, there's no monkey bars. And people are like, where are you going with this bike? Well, when we played, we played on monkey bars. Well, what does a monkey bar do when you go back and forth? It's tons of scapular and shoulder work. Right. How much stronger are they? Well, the kids nowadays don't even know what they are. So the basis of play is gone. They don't have braces like they used to. Um, they aren't able to ride the, the bikes up and down the neighborhood and meet somewhere and just play. So their bodies aren't conditioned the way ours were. Oh, I think exactly. I mean, the old school calisthenics actually makes more sense today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, but yet, I mean, I, I'm in the opinion and I may be wrong that the athlete seems to be getting bigger, faster, stronger at a younger age, but their bodies aren't prepared like ours were. So is that part of the injury rate also? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of it makes for a good argument. No, it does. I mean, you can also see careers shortening in the game, but I know competition levels have gone up. I mean, athletes. I th- I don't know if athletes are getting bigger. Or if in baseball, you're just seeing you know bigger p- bigger athletes are are being ex- are accepting the fact that they could be successful in baseball. But but I do think we are, you know, due to a child labor laws. I mean, we could get really into this that. We baby kids too long, way too long. And now that they can live off their parents, you know, you know, we can get into politics on this with health insurance until they're 27 <laughs> years old or whatever the number is. Like the point is, is like we've we've been constantly babying and babying and babying the youth every generation to where it gets easier and easier and easier. And unfortunately, it's to their detriment. None of that's going to help them because the studies show those that do physical activities younger in life typically do them later in life. So if you're not promoting to these young kids that they should be doing physical hard labor right out of the gate, those are the ones that are going to be lazy and and on health care later in life and dying, you know, a a torturous death, unfortunately, because we babied them, you know? Yeah, and it's it's the the work mentality of – and what we talked – I tried to talk to my athletes about is the truth is not everybody's going to play D1. Not very many are going to play D1, but what's going to what sports does in my facility is teaches young men and women that when you're tired and when you don't want to go train, you go train because that's part of it. And then for me, I ask them, I want you to be so good at whatever you do. The mentality is I don't want you to be a worker in the workforce. I want you to own the business and then go take everybody's business. I want you to understand that it's a process of work that even if it's not sports, it carries over into life. That's a big thing for me whenever I talk to schools and things like that. Of why are you doing this? Because it's not going to be easy. Life's not going to be easy. But I think we can teach life through sports. Sports isn't all about going and getting a ring because you took seventh place out of eight teams. I mean, that's just asinine to me. They're, I mean, we don't even, they're not even allowed to talk about rings and things like that in my facility unless it's a state championship, a national championship, something like that. I don't even want to hear about it. No, I, I think that's perfect, man. I think, um, you know, I think w- when you go through life, when you're young, money, rewards, you know, accolades, uh, social attention, they seem to be the reason we're alive. Like people think, well, God, there's some pleasure in this. This must be the reason we're alive, so I have to acquire more of it. But really, when you get some experience like we have, and you've done that, and you've acquired some of those things, and you find out they're really not that fulfilling, you start realizing, mm-hmm. hey, I think I, I, I didn't get the, I didn't, I don't really understand what's going on. I, I think I got the wrong picture. And then you start looking underneath everything and you start looking for the roots and the foundations and then you start realizing it 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 has nothing to do with what you achieve it has everything to do with your attitude and how you relate to other people and how what you represent in the world how you treat yourself and and who you represent in the world that 
that has everything to do with it. And if, if kids understood that, I think you, you can look at them as like not saying, hey, by you not getting up and working hard and doing this, this, and this, it's not, it, it, who cares it doesn't, like you said, get you the reward. What it does is it doesn't, it doesn't put you in a good position to represent yourself as a human being, as a respectable human being. Like, so if you don't go out and do the hard work and, and do those things, who, who are you? What are, what are people going to see and who do you represent? I think that's a better way to, to paint the picture to these young kids. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Uh, More worried about, uh, social media likes and things like that about maybe they got a cool song or something. You know, I mean, we're both on social media and we want people to follow it. This, but it's because we're trying to educate or show them some way to make themselves better. I don't really, if I didn't have a business, I wouldn't have social media. I don't really. I'm the same way. I, I don't think the, I would be touching I it. Like it's, it. I, it just paints a false picture of what's out there because when you get to know many of the people that their lives look perfect, you know, it, it's not. So I try to, like I said, I try to talk to my guys about, look, what's the, how did you uh, not perform but when you got that uh, ball four call that you were on the on the black that you thought should have been a strike, did you have a bad facial expression towards the umpire? Or did you get the ball and gr- did you grind down and get the next guy? Yeah, I'm more proud if you grind down and get the next guy than see some BS with your head, you know, stuck up your rear end, giving some facial expression. Because if you do that in life, the boss is either going to fire you or you're going to get punched in the mouth. Yeah, and I think that's obviously what, how you represent yourself. You're, you're a mentor. You're teaching them grit. You're teaching them uh, respect. You're teaching them, you know, how to, you know, achieve and be successful, but uh, doing it with a level head, doing it um, without expecting affirmation and whatever the rewards you'll get in return, just to do it out of just, you, you know, respect for yourself and, 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 what's the, and what's the right, right thing to do. Right. Exactly. Righteousness, man. I think it's cool. Mm-hmm. It's cool knowing that there's people like you out there because we need more coaches that are in it for the right reasons. And I think you're representing that re- really well. I appreciate that. Well, you know, a lot of the coaches nowadays too are, are, are becoming so young. They're in that, um, you know, they want to coach and that, but they're also stuck again. They're, they're stuck in the politics too of high school. And I, you know, as well as I do, you go to these big high schools, there's a lot of politics that these coaches have to deal with and it's not fair to them. They just want to coach. Most coaches aren't politics. They just want to go coach, but yet they have to deal with the school board or, Parents. you know, there's hand on, um, I don't know, the concession stand or the, I, I don't know what it is. Who's selling hats for somebody. Right. You know, and then they're having to take, well, he he does this or this guy did that. And most of these guys just want to coach. I have yet, I have not met a single coach yet that said, hey, Spike, how do I screw this kid up? Yeah, right. No, you know what I mean? Right. But they get pulled in so many directions. I wouldn't want a high school um, baseball coach's job ever. It's a tough gig. Yeah, especially today when the kids have so many other options. They have all these travel teams they can play on. You know, so if they're not happy, they can just leave and quit. When we were kids, you pretty much just had one team. <laughs> I mean, you had one team per season that you could make that was good and that you had to stick it out. And, and you know, coaches had a lot more leverage over players. And I think it created uh, better competition. It created uh, – it just created a greater and better environment. I think this – the flooding in baseball of all these tr- teams everywhere, I think, is ultimately uh, watered down the sport. Yeah, because, I mean, otherwise you'll get the kid that said, hey, man, I want to I want this a 2000 glove and it's three hundred and sixty five bucks. Well, why don't you take the the glove that's wore out and go take 100 ground balls? You're going to get better than with that glove. Or, you know what? My high school coach didn't play me here. Well, your job is to go be so good then that he has to play you and anything less. It doesn't work. Don't leave it up to the high school coach whether you're good enough. You're either so good that everybody's saying, why aren't you playing him? Or you leave yourself in that um, in that position to maybe not play because of politics or something like that. And if that's the case, then you've got to be so good that they have to play you. All right. And anything else, I think you're, just, you're not doing the kid a uh, service, at least not later on in life. Well, man, what are you going to do? Job from jump to jump, you know, job, uh, job to job, didn't work that way. 
Well, Spike, I think you're a perfect example of a, a player development coach that really believe in, in the kids you work with, that really want to mentor them and truly help them to be successful. And, and it seems like you'll go the extra mile. So, I mean, that's, I think that's a great, amazing uh, thing, to a quality to have as a coach. Kudos to you for that. And, and you know, I want people in your area to know that you exist and, and they can probably reach out to you. Can you can you tell them how to find you? Yeah, um, you can find me at um, South Central Regional Medical Center. Um, I've got my old email, uh, spike at spikesacrossfit.com. That always gets to me. I also have one under uh, spikesathletics at Gmail. Um, call me at 601-498-2079 anytime. Um, if I don't answer it, it's because I'm in a class. I'll return your call. And I appreciate you letting me be on. And I'm definitely trying to get uh, some camps up here to where we can get some of this good stuff that you're putting out there. Uh, and then I'm going to get some kids down there. I know for a fact I've got a couple that we've talked about that I'm going to – I don't know. We, I don't know if we got to go mow grass or what, but we're going to get them <laughs> down there with you. All right. Well, we're definitely going to stay in touch with that, man. But yeah, I would love to do something with you. And you're close by, which is cool. Where, where in Mississippi are you exactly? Yeah. Laurel. I'm right outside of Hattiesburg. Hattiesburg. Okay, you're not so too far away. Yeah, we're at all. South Mississippi. Yeah. About an hour and a half away, maybe. Yeah, yeah, we're close. We're right. Uh, we're we're the uh, hometown off HGTV. That's us, number one no show way. in the uh, so cool. country on HG. Yeah, isn't that funny? That's awesome. Well, good. Well, um, I'm gonna keep in touch. I'll fo- keep following you on okay. Instagram. And uh, thanks for doing the show, man. And uh, I'll send this over when, when we get it all together. Thank you very much for having me. Hold on a second. Let me uh, 